Okay, so um, those are questions specifically about um, the, the range of things that we preserve and whether that the value that we think exists in preserving endangered species spreads across all of them or only some of them, and then you can think about which ones. And to think about that question, we need to think about various possible ethical stances that go beyond simply reducing suffering and um, uh, increasing well-being for sentient beings. Because if, if we were only concerned with um, that, then we wouldn't be specifically focused on endangered species. Uh, the fact that a species is not endangered doesn't mean that the individuals suffer less. We would not be so f uh, focused on plants, except insofar as they're necessary to preserve ecosystems that include uh, sentient beings. And um, probably we would not have uh, much concern about uh, insects uh, or worms either, or at least they would be proportional to the likelihood that we think they are sentient. So what kind of larger ethic might we uh, embrace? Let me just look at a few of those. Um, some of you may have heard of, of Albert Schweitzer, um, not as well known now as he was um, maybe 50 years ago, uh, but uh, he was somebody who uh, went to Africa and opened a hospital in a, a remote jungle in Africa and wrote about ethics in various ways and promoted an ethic that he called reverence for life. And that phrase is still associated with his name. Um, and the idea is we should have uh, an attitude of reverence for all living things, for all life forms. Um, and uh, although he sometimes seemed to focus on animals and uh, promoted living as a vegetarian, um, he certainly uh, extended it to insects. Um, there's a line where he talks about um, preventing moths from fluttering into the candle at night. Um, so there's definitely a concern for insects. And, and generally, when he expresses it, he does talk about all life, which um, clearly includes plants. Um, and he doesn't really discuss in any, anywhere that I know in his writings in any depth the distinction between plant life and animal life, um, although promoting a vegetarian diet, he doesn't suggest anything about that we ought not to be killing plants in order to eat them, which uh, would be impossible to, to survive on, I suppose, unless you just wait for the nuts to fall from the tree. Um, but uh, uh, that ethic has often been one that people talk about. And the question then is to think about, well, why should we have an attitude of reverence for life as such rather than for sentient life. Um, if we think about sentient life, then the kinds of points that I've been making uh, obviously apply. There's capacities for suffering and for enjoying life, and those are important. If we think about life as a whole, we're including non-sentient life, and is there anything wrong with destroying that? So. Um, the, the idea of reverence for life might suggest that we should not at least wantonly destroy even plant life. Um, so you can think about some circumstances in which you might do that. Um, suppose that you're growing vegetables to eat. Is there anything, in, anything wrong with cutting the lettuce in order to eat it? Obviously, when you do that, you kill the lettuce, unlike uh, the nuts that fall from the tree. Um, you are killing the plant. Is there, is there any sense at all that it's regrettable that you have to do this in order to eat? Um, in the sense that you might have that if you have to kill a, a, a sentient being, um, is there any similar sense in the case of, of killing the lettuce? Um, or other examples, um, if you're sowing the seeds to grow the lettuces, well, um, not all lettuces come up, so it's usual, since seeds are plentiful, to sow them more thickly than you want lettuces. Right? So then, then once you've got a lot of seeds that have come up, then you thin them so that you end up with a lettuce every six inches or whatever it might be, every foot, um, spaced so that you get the best crop. But is there any 
harm in doing that? Would it be better only to sow as many seeds as you want lettuces so that you don't then have to destroy the seedlings, which you have no space to allow to grow? Um, if you believed in ethics for reverence for, reverence for life, you might, you might think that that's a reasonable inference for it. Uh, if you don't think that, it's hard to say, well, what, what exactly does it mean in practical terms? Um, but is, is there any real grounds for doing that, or is that a kind of a sentimentality that you're imagining that somehow the lettuce seedlings have interests that you're not respecting? Let's go to um, Leopold's uh, land ethic as an alternative to Schweitzer's um, ethic of reverence for life. So this is perhaps the most famous line in the essay that I've asked you to read, uh, The Land Ethic. There's a lot of discussion in it. It's, uh, you have to remember that The Land Ethic was written, I think that was written in the 40s and was only published posthumously in uh, 1949. But you have to remember that this is before there was the, what we think of as uh, the environmental movement. Uh, Leopold actually talks in that essay about the conservation movement of today. Um, there was certainly some conservation movements at various times in the um, uh, history of the US and other countries. There have been movements to preserve national parks. They go back to the 19th century. Um, and there are various other kinds of conservation to conserve soils and wilderness. But there was certainly nothing as widespread as we've basically seen since the 1970s in terms of preserving the environment. So, um, so Leopold's essay is talking about the lack of that kind of ethic at the time. Um, and he's proposing a new ethical approach, uh, which he calls the land ethic. And uh, this is how he sums it up towards the end of that essay. Um, and I don't, I don't want to give you the idea that the essay all hangs on whether this is defensible. I think there's a lot of good points in the essay about the way in which we're thinking short-sightedly, we're thinking in narrowly economic terms, and there are other values. But um, this is the line that most often gets quoted. So, he's claiming that it's really a criterion of right action, just as uh, we, we talked about in the first couple of, of weeks. Um, a criterion of right action is that something is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic, biotic community and wrong when it tends otherwise. Well, if, the first thing that, anyone, that you would say is um, this is obviously not a complete account of what's right. Um, in that sense, Leopold is talking loosely because there's many things that you could do which would be wrong, which would not be right even if they tended to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. You might think that there are too many people living in a certain area to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community, and you might therefore just decide to kill some of them. Um, well, uh, I don't think Leopold would be saying that's right because it preserves the integrity, etc. He would say, you've got to find better ways uh, of doing that that don't, um, that, that don't do things that are evidently wrong, like killing people against their will. So, um, you know, Leopold is not a philosopher. He's an ecologist. He was a forester. Um, uh, so, I think don't take it uh, too literally in that sense. But what about the criteria more generally? Um, you need to a notion of uh, integrity and stability and beauty to apply to biotic communities. So by biotic communities here, let's say we mean the ecosystem, would probably be the, a term that we would more commonly use for that today. So um, what do we mean by integrity, stability, and uh, beauty? Uh, so integrity generally means something like wholeness. Um, does that suggest that you have to preserve the ecology, the ecosystem, from anything coming from outside. Um, that relates also to the question of stability. One of the issues that often happens, and that I'll say a little bit about um, before the end of this topic, is we get species coming from outside to ecosystems. <laughs> so in some cases, this may be species that have come, that have been actually introduced by human beings. So. Um, Obviously, in the United States, 
there are a number of, of species that uh, come from human beings um, that were either deliberately or accidentally um, introduced. In some cases, uh, plants that accidentally spread, that may be plants that were brought over as garden ornamentals that then <laughs> escaped. Um, the classic example of a deliberate uh, and ecologically disastrous human introduction is the introduction of rabbits into Australia, uh, where European settlers thought that rabbits would be both uh, uh, something useful to eat uh, for people to go hunting and uh, also uh, just attractive to have rabbits bobbing around the landscape as they did in England. But um, uh, they multiplied very rapidly and um, uh, we'll, get to the, we'll get to this a bit later um, with devastating consequences. So there are cases like that where you could perhaps easily say well, introducing the rabbit was wrong to Australia because it did not promote the integrity or stability uh, of the ecosystem. Uh, beauty, as I suggested, might be more debatable. Maybe some people did think the rabbits were beautiful. Um, but uh, integrity and stability, no. But then there can be other things that change anyway. I mean, the idea that ecosystems are always stable is something of a myth. The idea that there's a steady balance of nature so that without human intervention everything is in harmony is not really right. That we, do, we, we now understand that even without human intervention you can get situations where populations of animals grow um, and then they eat up all the available habitat and then populations crash. So if you take for example um, elephants uh, elephants don't have a lot of predators, but they do eat a lot of, of uh, plant food. So you can get elephants overpopulating areas and um, then that area being denuded, elephant population crashing or having to move on somewhere else um, and long, long periods before the ecosystem recovers. And uh, indeed you can get quite permanent changes to ecosystems occurring. So the notion of um, Integrity and stability isn't really a completely obvious one. 